there's a little known fact to that. Um, there's a thing with, with the, um, the geisha. You're not allowed to show the same patron, the same kimono, in any given season. If Mr. Joe Blow comes over on Monday and he's scheduled to come on Wednesday too, you have to be sure that she, you're wearing a different kimono than Monday and Wednesday. And things get complicated when it's not just Joe, but also Tutto who's coming. And Tutto's coming on Monday and Thursday. I see this little notebook that she has, or she had, which actually had a schedule for the kimono. <laughs> G'day, I'm Kama. And I'm Blowy. It's the Kama and Blowy show. Kama and Blowy. Kama and Blowy. Walking and talking. Kama and Blowy. Kama and Blowy. Good afternoon, Kama. That's right, Blowy. It is afternoon. You got it right today. I'm good. How are you? Yeah, a bit of rain, but um, everything's good. Now, I'm really sorry to do this to you so early, Blowy. Oh, but, um, I'm getting another. I've got something really good I want to um, talk to you about. Something really interesting. So yeah, I'm, I'm really sorry, but I'm um, just getting another call coming through. Okay, just one sec. Okay. Oh, it, it's Paprika Girl. Hello. Hi. How are you guys doing? How are you I'm doing? good. Yeah, good. Thanks, Dave. Uh, Camera and I—we're just um, filming a podcast at the moment. Oh, am I interrupting? Oh, would you like to oh. join us? Uh, I wouldn't want to impose. Is that all right? No, oh. you'd be more than welcome. <laughs> Count me in then. <laughs> Great. Okay, so, Paprika Girl. How do you do? Yeah, where are you at the moment? I'm just taking a walk. I thought I would um, come over to the park over here. Cause it's nice and cool in this area. Where in the world are you? Oh, I'm in, um, right now I'm in Kichijoji, which is a suburb of Tokyo in Japan. Middle yeah, of summer, great. very hot, <laughs> as it always is. <laughs> and um, usually um, we um, ask people what their nickname is, but um, since we've been calling you Paprika Girl, um, what's your real name? Well, you can, okay, my real name is Ricky. It's R-I-K-I, -I, Ricky. So it's kind of like Ricky Martin, but like a girl's version. It was, a, it was a thing during the 80s. I mean, you know, everyone would name their kids like these boyish names, and it was, except with eyes or, you know, misspelling it in some way. And where does the name Paprika Girl come from? Oh, well, um, my background is Hungarian. So I'm not a Hungarian citizen per se, but... Um, my grandparents are Hungarian and they moved here um, just during the war or moved to uh, Canada during the war and since then um, you know the Hungarian influence has been very strong so Hungarian food uses a lot of paprika <laughs> so of course when I was thinking of a name I'm like well I can't think of anything <laughs> except you know Hungarian paprika which is me I guess nice um so t today, um, I'm actually um, we actually filmed a podcast in the morning, and um, where I am in Australia, in Melbourne, we're currently on um, level four lockdown. So you're only allowed to go out. You're only allowed out of your house once a day um, for exercise. So this one, I'm actually um, walking on the treadmill, and um, I've I've set up a green screen behind me. So I'm going to go film some footage and pretend that I'm walking along with you guys as well. So um, I'd love to show you. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> yeah. So there you go. I hope you're enjoying the outside. I've got my roller door up in the garage so I can see outside, but um, we'll just pretend that I'm actually walking along with everyone. Well, it's lovely. We have, we have cicadas are very noisy this time of year. You might even be able to hear them. And um, the breeze is blowing. It's only it's only 30 degrees today, so it's not as hot as it usually is. And the spring, of course, makes it even nicer, you know. It's all this green everywhere. Yeah. Now, today, um, we've only really interacted through Twitter, and um, I was asking you on Twitter about your experiences working in the film industry in Japan and if you'd written about them, and you said, uh, not really sure that anyone's interested, but I think they really would be, and so I'd really like to talk about that today. So I guess... A good place to start is like how you actually got into the film industry, whether that was in Japan or elsewhere, and then obviously coming to Japan. Oh, well, um, let's see. 
when I first got to Japan, I didn't speak any Japanese whatsoever. So I had to do something in order to, you know, I had to get a job, I had to pay for college, all these things. I came on of my own volition because um, my dad was paying for college when I was in Chicago University. But when um, I came out here, he's like, well, you, oh, sure, but you're on your own, kid. So I'm like, okay, I need a job. So the only thing I could think of that didn't really require a lot of language skills was to be a television extra. And television extra, I don't know, if, I think you had some experience in the industry. We have, uh, I'd like to pretend it's a lot, but um, yeah, we, we've had a little bit though, television commercials and some uh, extra work as well, student films, etc. Well, they don't even know what I'm talking about. You know, they, they say stand there, smile, look pretty, and that's it. Yeah. <laughs> you know? But yeah, I did um, a lot of that stuff when I was in college, and thank God when I was first here, the industry was... It had enough, it, you know, it's still on its last legs, of course, but um, there was enough uh, money in the industry, so the extras were paid, paid pretty good. So I was able to put myself through college with that. And um, as a result, though, I also made a lot of really good connections. So graduation rolled around, and they asked me, what are you going to do? Because <laughs> it seems to be the time that everyone's getting a job then. And me, yeah. being kind of clueless about absolutely everything, I would just... Uh, I would just say, I have no idea. And so one of this director friend of mine said, hey, how about you become an assistant director? I'm like, what the hell's an assistant director? <laughs> He's like, I'll show you. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I've been doing that now for almost 20 years. <laughs> yeah, wow. So these early roles that you were talking about as extras, what kind of um, roles were you playing? Um, it's always the standard, since you know, I'm a foreigner, um, very white chick, <laughs> standard looking kind of um, Hungarian Jewish girl. So um, I would be the college student who came to town or the tourist who was clueless about everything or <laughs> the goofy looking foreigner on the, on the side making funny faces or there would be a lot of um, variety shows which I'd be, on, I'd be on representing Hungary because Hungary is a very rare country to have, you know, to have someone come visit from I suppose. So I have to look up stuff on Hungary and tell them that the Hungarian national flower is like poppy or something, which it's not. <laughs> so it's just a lot of standard foreigner stuff. Um, and so, what, what were you actually um, studying when you were in a, when you were at uni, at university? Originally, when in Chicago, it was forensics, but when I came over to Japan, they didn't have forensics, so I settled for the history of science. It's called philosophy of science, technically. But it's um, why society, um, what, what sort of a situation in society most best encourages the development of science and uh, forward thinking or new thinking in the scientific areas. So it has very little to do with forensics or film. Or film, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nothing to do with it. <laughs> okay, and so... Because you were like you were thrown into the um, film industry, I'm sure it's a cutthroat industry to try and get into if you had tried to get in there yourself. Oh yeah, I mean anyone who's in the industry knows. I mean you're, you're kind of either dragged into it, kicking and screaming, or <laughs> or you're kind of you happen to stumble into it the same way you'd stumble into a pond or something like that and can't get out. <laughs> it's it's wonderful, but um, the thing is, is that. Uh, I work as an assistant director, though, you know, an assistant director isn't exactly glamorous. It's the person behind the set who's yelling at everyone to be there on time and get together all the props and cast all the extras and do all the things that nobody else wants to do. That's the job of an assistant director. So to be very honest, I mean, they don't last long. So a lot of people, they, they'll start with an assistant director thing and then they'll leave within a few months. So yeah, there is some sort of kind of competition in a way but I mean there's always openings too so if you're staff and not you're not trying to be a star or anything but you're trying to be staff and you're trying to make a living on it I mean there's enough work to get you by if that's what you're looking for and regarding the types of work available as well like I think you broke it up into a few categories before like you're saying the movie making business isn't really so well paid television a bit better obviously commercial stuff as well can you kind of uh Give us a broad picture of what that's like. 
Well, um, generally speaking, the okay. In America, you have tons and tons of money, and in many other countries, you have tons and tons of money, and there are these wonderful things they call subsidies, and um, so therefore, the, the any of these film industries, especially countries with strong ones like Australia or England, or of course the United States, or even next door Korea or China, they have a lot of money which is put into there and supported by the government in different kinds of ways. Well. Japan has zero, absolutely nothing, not a farthing. And so <laughs> the thing is, is that um, okay, the, the, so the glamour is still there because because everyone would, you know, they, they want to, you know, they want to try stardom or they want to try creativity or they want to play with colors, there's light on film. There's all different reasons to get into the industry, but you have to do it of your own volition, right? You have to be aware of the fact that no one's just going to give you money <laughs> to do what you want to do. So a lot of people do come to Japan and see the film industry. They want to participate in the film industry. But they're surprised at how little pay if there is, if any. So, you know, an extra job which you might get paid, like the United States, I don't know, I'm guessing maybe $200 a day or something, you'll get maybe $50 here for, if you get that at all. And so it's very similar in the same way for like any kind of you're a director and you want to get something made, you have some great ideas, no one's going to give you money to do it. You have to actually knock on doors of Little Bread Farm over there and say, hey, would you be willing to invest $20 in my movie? Maybe, please? And so that's how most everything is, is made over here. Fortunately with film, um, I'm sorry, when it comes to the larger film com uh, companies, they do have distribution and contracts where they have a little more money than the average person, but it's nothing that they have like in the States. And television, of course, you always have to have something broadcasted all the time. So since it's a 24-hour kind of broadcast, you have to have that much stuff made and ready and waiting to be broadcast. So there's enough of it so that you have to be paid a decent amount of money so that you continue and don't quit on them. So you can make a little bit more on television if um, you're willing to work the hours that they put into it. I think a lot of my friends, by the way, they're always saying how like the film industry, it runs on fumes and love. Because whenever you're cast into the film industry as any sort of job, whether it be a cameraman or a sound or colorist or an actor, whatever it is, it's usually because you were working with someone on a project beforehand. And that same person said, hey, we're going to start another thing next month. If you're free, please join. And it's really hard to turn that down because you know that they're struggling to be able to pay for it in the first place. And so it's always these little tiny jobs which are just squeaking you by. But, you know, for as much as that sounds awful, I have been doing it for 15 years and <laughs> I'm still okay. So it just kind of time passes, you know. And you've never got to the point where you felt like quitting or uh, trying something else? Oh, heck yes! Every time I do anything. <laughs> so, every single time they're like, oh, this is, here, this is what you do, and you get there and it's a lot more, a lot worse than you usually say it is. But then you're like, I'm never doing this again. And of course, they ask you next month, will you do it again? They're like, sure. <laughs> so, that's because I'm, you know, not that smart, maybe. <laughs> and so, because you're doing like such a variety of things, have you got like one um, project that you'd worked on that you're really proud of and that you want to share? Hmm. I don't know if it's worth sharing or anything. One of the projects that I did way back when was when I first started. Um, I was still a low-level AD, but at the time, it uh, it was a, the first time I'd ever worked for Toei. And Toei is one of the oldest film companies in Japan. The oldest being Nikatsu. This is probably the second um, right up there with Toho and then there's the big three. And um, they were filming this uh, drama series called Aibo. And Aibo was the most popular police drama on television at the time. And uh, the director happened to be a friend of mine. And he said, look, we're, we're looking for a second AD. If you're interested, I'd like to put you in the, in the staff. And I accepted this, but I didn't re recognize at the time how very rare and amazing it would be to work with that particular director. So the director was um, Mr. Izumi Seiji, but he was already in his, his 70s at the time. 
was very old, but he'd, he'd gone through like all the best parts of the film industry. And he would introduce me to people like, like crazy names, like, like, um, Kadokawa Haruki, who is well known for making the Kadokawa Film, uh, company, but also for being quite, quite a bad boy <laughs> in terms of, he's been arrested a few times, but all sorts of crazy things that he did. But these were the people who really created the film industry as we know it today. So to be able to be on set like that, and not only to be sent, <laughs> he, he didn't yell at me the way that he normally does, normally does like 80s. Instead, he would really teach me. So he would give me a clapperboard and show me how to use it. And he'd show me the focal lengths of the camera and, um, and how to w w break up a script and what to look for and who to talk to in regards to casting and who not to talk to. And all these things that you don't learn at film school and you don't learn from a normal film set, um, I learned from him. So even today, when I tell people that um, I trained on Ibo, I get all the big eyes and everyone's all happy and they're like, what? How the hell did you handle working in Toei? I'm like, Toei's like cutthroat. What is, how do you handle that? And it's like, it's all thanks to um, Izumi Seiji and the things that he taught me there. And I, it took me a few years before I realized how important an, uh, an opportunity that really was. So. So. He just connected with you, did he? Because it doesn't sound like he would normally um, take on people to mentor like this, or does he? I think he, every once in a while he's been known to do that, and he does speak fondly of his old ADs. So he knows where they are and what they're doing, and um, it'll be 20 years or something since he met them, but he'll still say, oh, well, you know, Azuma, he's over there, he's filming this thing right now, and I haven't seen him in three years, but I hear he's doing great, and... So, I mean, in a way, I would say no. He was a lot nicer to me, maybe, because I'm a girl. But um, it's, it's something that I think that a lot of the older generation, especially the ones who know that they're kind of on the way out, they like to impart their information. They like to impart their, their, you know, their thoughts and their learning and stuff to somebody who appreciates it. So there's that. Um, scouting as well, obviously, is a... I mean, I can just think of my own, uh, I lived in Tokyo for two years and uh, so many incredible locations there, but you obviously want to avoid using the same tired kind of uh, spots. But are there any places there that are notoriously hard to get uh, permission or permits to kind of uh, film in? Well, I'll tell you something interesting. Um, you can film pretty much anywhere you want. The thing is... Um, the way that you get permits is the same way you'd get permits in, like, Goodfellas, you know? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so, <laughs> the guy, if you want to film in, let's say, the notoriously difficult, it's very difficult to film, for example, in um, the area of Kabukicho in Shijuku, yep. right? Yep. And Kabukicho is, you know, it's a, it's a lovely, beautiful, it's a wonderful, run-down, rusty, they call it in Japanese, but it's, a, it's so full of... Um, character. It's an area really full of character. It's a lot of drinking bars and you know all the yakuza hang out there and all their malls are hanging out on the on the corner and it's just wonderful area. But um, you can't get a permit there. Not according to Shinjuku uh, uh, the, um the town hall. They're not going to give you a permit. But if you want a permit, what you got to do is you go into the right bar and you say, I want to film here really bad. And you explain your idea to the owner of the bar. The bar goes, oh yeah, well, maybe we got to tell Joe about this. And so he'll take you over to Joe's bar. And <laughs> Joe hear the story. He's like, all right, we got to talk to Taro about this. I'll take you over to Taro's bar. And Taro will be sitting there in his Zabuton looking like an old Gigi, you know. He's got this, like, cigarette hanging out of his lip and everything. It's great. He's watching TV on sumo in his underwear. And he'd be like, I want to I wanna film here. He's like, eh, what you filming? Yeah, because I film. Oh, is it good? I'll tell you about it. You tell him about it, you have three drinks with him, and he goes, you know, you're a good kid. I'll let you film. And that's how you get your permit. So, wow. <laughs> and so you've I had, like, three. ten drinks by then, by the end of it, because <laughs> you've had it's to have one wonderful. at every bar. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's nice, you know, you know, I'm a girl, too, so it's a little bit nicer because they always pay for the drinks. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's, I've done that two or three times until now in areas of the city and other areas of the country which you're not sure you can film. You talk to the people who are the locals, the ones who really own the area, and, and they'll help you, you know? 
they're they're wonderful. They really are. <laughs> yeah. Do you have any dream spots that you'd really like to um, shoot in? Oh God. Do you know anyone? I, I love Akita. I absolutely love Kakuno Latte in Akita. I filmed. Um, I filmed a. Uh, there was. There used to be this series where um, it's called the Doyo Wai Do Gekijo, and it was. Um, it's Saturday afternoon. It's like Saturday afternoon theater, and it would always be the same old Showa people. These these Showa stars who have now gotten old, and there would be some sort of a murder which took place takes place at an onsen, and all these like, and they'd go to to try to stop the murder all while um, trying to save their marriage. And in the meantime, there would be this this like group of like teenage girls with big boobs which would be hanging out in the onsen just at the right time to make it very awkward for everyone and. It's just a wonderful series of absolute corn. It's great. <laughs> and um, I, was film, I filmed there about maybe, I'd say maybe 13 years ago, maybe 12, 13 years ago when I first started, uh, I was starting the AD stuff. And it was the most beautiful place I've ever filmed. I mean, I mean, it was right in the middle of, uh, beginning of November. So everything was red and gold. And you have these samurai houses which are lining the main road over there. And you have like all these people which... They'll peek out of their homes because they know you're filming something, so they'll peek out. And that's part of the fun because, you know, you know, as an AD, you have to go run and say, don't peek out right now. We have to pass and pretend that they're not weirdo or something like that, you know. So um, make excuses. But it was so beautiful that I really honestly thought that I have to come back. So I've been, I've had actually had a script that I've been trying to work on to try to get permits to film there again. But, um, you know, it's in the works. Everything's always in the works and time goes by and... Ten years go by, and you know how it is. <laughs> so, so do you get uh, the um, like? You hear stories like in the Australia or America, Hollywood, whatever. The the really precious um, actors and actresses that are really tough to work with. Is it similar <laughs> yes. similar in Japan with the Japanese people? Oh God, yes. <laughs> oh really? <laughs> I'm not going to tell you the name of this of this series, but oh God, can I tell you a horror story? Please. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, um, last um, uh, December, I was working on a Fuji television uh, drama with an actor that shall not be named. And um, he's always been kind of famous as being a, a, kind of a press. <laughs> um, but I didn't, you know, I don't take any, put any salt in those kinds of rumors because there's a lot of times you meet someone, they're not half as bad as everyone says they are. But this guy, he was worse. I mean, he would... <laughs> purposefully, like it's the AD's job to kind of control the set and manage everything so that nothing goes wrong and everything runs on time and he's wearing the right costume and things like that, right? Well, this guy would go out of his way to be late coming out of his room because he wanted to pick on, not me because I'm the, I'm the first AD, but he'll pick on the little ones, the runners, the kids, these like 20 year old little girls who are running around trying to get the actors out on time. They, he call, they called out 15 minutes before they have to get onto set. And then he'll be like, he'll be strolling out 20 minutes later. And then he'll get onto set and he'll be like, oh, they didn't tell me. Or I didn't know. Or say something like that. And I remember there was this one time where um, he never read the script, ever. So he'll get onto set and they'll have spoken about the script. So what happens is that he's brought out, the screen, the scene is blocked. The director tells him what to do and where to go, right? And so then the actor will go to the end of the hall or whatever it is that he's supposed to be walking from. And so in runs this little bitty AD girl. She's like, she's, she's 20 years old. She, this is like her second project ever. And so she goes and she has to stand by him because that's her job. She has to stand by him and make sure he has water and a towel and anything else that he might need. And he says to her suddenly, he goes, she goes, what scene is this? And, of course, she's panicked because she thinks it's scene 14, right? And then, but she's not sure suddenly now because, you know, because, you know, she's panicking, right? So she's, she's like, she's like, um, 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 uh, I think, I think, I think. And she's trying to answer. And then he goes, he goes, wait, what's my motivation then? What, what, what kind of a feeling do I need when I'm walking down this wall, this hall here? And he, and she's like, um, I don't know, because she's, part of her job is to, get together the props. She was just looking over the props. She wasn't looking at what the director was telling him for the last 20 minutes, right? So he starts yelling at her like, 
Aren't you an AD? You're a directorial team. You should know what's going on on set. This is what's wrong with the industry today. You guys are just don't know what you're doing anymore. And he really railed on her. And um, I, the only reason I was able to hear this is because she had, I don't know, she like made another mistake, but <laughs> she jammed her elbow into the radio. <laughs> and so this was broadcast to the entire crew. <laughs> so, and he was all smiles and oh my God, look at me, I'm a star kind of bullshit when, whenever um, he was in front of them. But yeah. as soon as he got in front of her, which he knew that she was a weakling, um, he would just yep. like, he would just pick on her. Uh, so that guy was so notorious at um, Pitch Television for being an absolute bum. Yeah. But, you know, he was contracted, so they have to put him in three dramas for an entire year. Mm. So they had no choice. But still, I mean, I would never work with him again. Ever, yeah. ever. That's just yeah. one of the horror stories. But, you know, there, there are a bunch of them. <laughs> yeah. God. Um, Moving a, a, a away from that for a while, um, I've noticed on Twitter as well, you're often posting uh, pictures of you with uh, different Japanese uh, sweets or, you know, kimono kind of... Uh, uh, post as well. Can you tell us a bit about your interest in that and like uh, it seems pretty wide-ranging oh, um, Well When I first got to Japan, I didn't really have any real um, Interest I wasn't I wasn't interested. I just didn't know anything about Japan Didn't know anything about um, anime or anything like that, but um, I did um, But it was uh, after I met my husband right now and he's in um, he was also in the same university as me, the same major as I had. He went on to become a professor, and I went into film. But um, his family is very, very unique. So um, he's the direct descendant of a famous samurai who kicked up a rebellion during uh, the end of uh, the Heian period. So he was raised with a very unique sense of pride and a very unique set of manners. And so from his grandfather, he had um, he was taught all the things that every samurai ought to know, kind of thing, right? His grandfather was actually quite a big tease in his day, too. And his grandmother, who of course was not a samurai, um, but she was a geisha. And she was a geisha over in an area called Kagurazaka, which is a very lovely area of Tokyo. And um, as a geisha, you're... Your, um, your job is to know absolutely everything and use it well. So you have to know how to dance and how to sing and how to uh, play the, I think she did the koto, play some instrument. You have to know about politics and about current events. You have to hold names and be able to recite poetry and all sorts of crazy stuff like that. And when I met her, she was already in her 80s. But she took one look at me, and she's like, okay, I've adopted you. You are now my granddaughter. <laughs> this is before we were even married or anything like that. So, <laughs> And so from that moment, um, she just she started sending me kimonos. Um, she started to teach me how to dance. She started to teach me tea. She started to teach me everything that... Um, and, I mean, like, all these amazing things about Japanese culture that I had no idea existed. And it's just so neat. So the further I got into it, the more interesting it became. And because of her influence, uh, I was, I learned, I, you know, I got a lot of kimonos from her. So <laughs> if you don't use kimonos, they go bad. So she would um, send me so many that uh, I, I would just have to, <laughs> you know, I had to wear them. Otherwise, you know, it wasn't really fair. And so I was wearing all these kimonos every day. And I think it was just being surrounded in all that like culture it was kind of handed down to me in a way so I couldn't say no you know and then before I knew it I mean my entire life somehow in some way had become Japanicized I mean I wasn't really go I wasn't really trying to do it but before I knew it it's like I started to learn the Japanese names of the seasons and I started to know how to mix tea and I started to know how to put or to put kimonos on both men and women, and all these little things that you share. And I think that one of the things that most impressed me about grandmother was that she would point out little things. It's like she wouldn't she wouldn't say, look, it's a geisha, but she'd say like, oh, look at the hairpin on that lovely girl. Or 
she'll be like, oh, look at the flower, how its leaves are cut in just this way, so picturesque. And it's these little tiny things that she would praise. And that's what made me start to notice it, too. And I guess it really affected everything. So my grandmother died a few years ago. But um, I think that she really, really, like, transformed me. She turned me into maybe the next generation of herself, in a sense. And I really do appreciate that, you know. <laughs> and that's, that's a big compliment of her actually wanting to... Um do that for you as well, like that she probably saw you and said, oh, um, you're worthy of it, I guess. And so that's a big compliment, I believe. I'm very flattered. Possibly it is. It really is. I think so too. I know that her daughter had no interest in kimono, but, and of course she had only grandsons. And so, so she couldn't give her kimono to anyone else. And so I think it was that. And of course, um, my my other husband's um, brother's wife, who's a very beautiful lady. She was Miss Japan 2009. But um, she was wonderful, but she's also 180-something centimeters tall. So she's like, she's like 188 or something like that. She's really tall. So um, any of these old kimono, they just, they just don't fit. <laughs> There's that. So, well, there are reasons. There are lots of different little reasons, but yeah. Um, I do appreciate being chosen by grandmother. <laughs> and when you say a lot of kimonos, like what kind of numbers are we talking? Are we talking dozens or hundreds? Or? Hundreds. Hundreds. Hundreds, okay. <laughs> there's a little known fact that um, there's a thing with, with the, um, the geisha, especially in Kagurazaka, and I think maybe in Gion too, where you're not allowed to show the same patron, the same kimono in any given season. So, if Mr. Joe Blow comes over on Monday, and he's scheduled to come on Wednesday too, you have to be sure that she, you're wearing a different kimono than Monday and Wednesday. And things get complicated when it's not just Joe, but also Taro who's coming. And Taro's coming on Monday and Thursday. So, um, they, I see this little notebook that she has, or she had, which actually had a schedule for the kimono. Wow. <laughs> it's just... I don't know, it's, a, it's, it's just wonderful. <laughs> These days there'd be an app or something for it, but yeah, back in those days, you'd have to number your kimonos or something. <laughs> you'd have to, see to that. number them, yeah. I was wondering how they would um, <laughs> like know which one, but yeah, it'd have to be some type of numbering system or who knows. <laughs> well, I don't know, I think the youth of today can remember all the Pokemon and all their attacks <laughs> now, so I think they could remember a few kimonos. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, Paprika Go, we've come to the 30 minute mark and um, it's been lovely having you on the show. Aww. Well, thank you for calling me. I just kept on talking. I don't know if that's appropriate or not. Well, I mean, this is the kind of stuff that I was looking for, so um, I knew it would be interesting. Thank you very much for having me. Now, do you know how we end our show? How do you end your show? Well, it's, um, it's, it's up to you, but usually um, we'll either punch the camera or you can headbutt the camera, or you can make up a different ending if you want. But whatever you choose, um, we all do it at the same time. And boom. And boom. G'day, I'm Kama. And I'm Blowy. It's the Camera and Blowy Show. Kama and Blowy.